So just that harness thing. Again, I love random animals at church. I had never heard of it. And they had done it for years, and yet I had never heard of it. They just needed to harness it. And so it's like, what are those things that you're just like, <coughs> baptisms. You got baptisms at your church? Harness it somehow. Get their picture taken. So look for a way not just to get people in the doors. Look for a way to serve families. Man, I want a picture taken of my family. Um, we've had parents pass away. The, the last picture they got with their daughter was on Mother's Day. That's awesome, you know? Sometimes life is so busy you don't get a picture with your dad. You don't get a picture with your mom. And now you just got this simple way to do that. It's awesome. Do you schedule certain Sundays in advance? Like said, we're going to do baptism this Sunday. Yep. Y'all come or are you, you wait for them to contact you? We did that in the past with infant baptisms. Now we're doing much more baptism Sundays where we can really, I felt guilty in the past. It really felt like you're getting your kid baptized and it's a nuisance. I kind of felt like that, like you're kind of a nuisance to the church. Yeah, we'll do this and whatever. And man, you want to talk about three, and this is where I've, I've harped on our team too. I feel like we are, if you said I'm having an affair at Embrace, I feel like you'd be cared for really well. If you said my marriage is struggling, I have an addiction, I feel like you'd be cared for really well. But if you said I have a kid that needs to be baptized and I'm interested in getting married, I feel like we are, we're terrible. And those are two of the most intimate times that you will remember forever. So we figured out the baptism. Now I feel great. We had one family who said, I almost want to have another baby just so I can go through that. <laughs> and I'm like, I have four kids. We are not having any more babies. But um, so we haven't figured out the wedding part, though. But that's something they'll never forget. And so I think we lose a lot of weddings. Before, they used to be one of our biggest opportunities. I would do all the weddings myself, which is impossible now. But man, you get an opportunity to show that you're a normal person. Be real up there. I mean, that's an opportunity. He's not this stiff board up there that's, yep, reminds me of why I hate going to church. They actually have a sense of humor. They're fun. They're normal. They dance. They, they dance. That's crazy. Who never? And they have, like, fun. Like, it's just, it's an opportunity, but we have not been good at that, so need to get better at that, but harnessing those opportunities. And then the other was, the, uh, it, this is years ago. It's lost its luster, so we're looking at what to do with it. Um, uh, other church, uh, no other church at the time was doing an egg hunt, and then we started it. We just started, not we started it, we did not start anything. Nothing's new under the sun. Take that, that was a misstep. Uh, other churches across the country had done it. Nobody in Sioux Falls had done it. And um, a church had done it like a few years before us that did it on a Saturday. We don't want to get you to a Saturday, we want to get you to a Sunday service. That's, I mean, we're, we want to be intentional. So what we did, um, we did an egg hunt after every single one of our services, um, including there was a golden ticket and some of the eggs so they can get like something fun, a pass to Wild Water Web, blah, 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 just all this kind of stuff. And um, we had a really high Palm Sunday because of Buddy. And, um, and then I, I warned our, I'll never forget it, I warned our team, hey guys, um, it's gonna be a low Sunday just to let you know about it. Like, just be prepared. I kind of warn everybody in advance, it's gonna be low. And that was the first year we did the egg hunt. And again, it was just one of those. And more than an egg hunt, you get to share the hope of Jesus with a whole bunch of people who are, who are desperate for him. And so just harnessing those things. Just look at everything you do. Is this, is, uh, one of the things we're trying to determine, what is a win? Is a win just getting a whole bunch of people to ninja camp? Uh, well, that sounds like a really empty win. Or is it getting a whole bunch of kids to ninja camp so we can introduce them to Jesus? so they can stick to our kids' ministry. Like, just really define that, and if it's not winning, don't do it. Your team is already spread too thin. That's what we do so much in the church. We have our team so overworked and spread thin, it's no wonder we, we hand out crap. Just even quality level, I'll never forget a guy, this is years ago, a guy came up to me and he's like, I expected the, the music here to suck. And I said, why, why do you say that? And he's like, because it always sucks at churches. And I was like, oh. And he's like, yeah, seriously, like the bars are always 10 times better. And I was like, you're right. And, and in the Old Testament, you see God bring your best craftsmen, your finest craftsmen, like work for the Lord as it, work as if you're working for the Lord. Like just all those things of bringing our best in our A game from preaching to whatever. Again, knowing that ultimately it rests on Jesus. So again, at first hustle, at, in the middle kind of harness, and we're still doing that. 
now we're really kind of less is more and trying to be intentional. Um, really making sure we're reaching people outside the church instead of already church people. Um, so the marriage event, um, the ninja camp. Um, another thing we've, we're doing, and um, we're trying to get still on our feet at our broadcast campus, our new camp's pastor, but we've, we've done something at another campus, a couple other campuses called Post 30s. So, um, hey, uh, next week we're doing a Post 30, and we're going to be doing like, um, hot dogs, chips, and drinks uh, outside, um, or we're going to do games. Like they had one, one time they had like motorized, I don't even know how they did this, motorized go-karts or something, and they did races. They've done tug-of-war. They've done everything. And what I love about Post 30 is uh, it's, a, it's only a 30-minute commitment. It's outside. It's not in a back dungeon. Our fellowship halls, I wish we could take all that space and make it our entryways. Fellowship halls are scary to first-time guests. Entryways are, are safe. And so, like, we do it in our entryway or outside, those post-30s. And they just give a little bit more, like, hey, um, afterwards at the service, we have a post-30. It's not a post-two hours. It's not a post-anything for 30 minutes. And, it, and it, it, it's like, if you want to connect more, if you want community, if you're not ready to leave, it gives just a, a really simple baby step. And it's amazing how, long time, how our long-term church people, how disconnected they are. And they don't know anybody in the church especially after a summer in, in Sioux Falls, a lot of people will come back and say, I don't feel like I know half this room. It's like, because you've been gone for eight months. Like, you've been, I don't remember, you, you haven't been here since Easter. Mm -hmm. And so I, those post-30s have been a great opportunity to do that. But right now, we're really less is more, trying to focus again on guests, groups, students, and buildings. And buildings part is two, two campuses. One needs to find a building, before we get kicked out next August, and the other RT campus is so overloaded, we need to get a new building for them. And then our broadcast campus, we're wanting to expand. So, any questions on all of that? That's a lot. Take it all with a grain of salt, guys. Uh, just a real quick question about um, just the practicality. So you said you had uh, worship at uh, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's what it was. Now it's 8 30, 10, and 11 30. So, did you do post 30 after every single service? We, um, at, so we've never done it at the broadcast campus before. At the other campuses, we did it after the last service. Um, but I, I think what we would do at the broadcast campus, the, the first two services are too full. So, I'd actually intentionally not do it at those two services to drag people at 11 30 and that five. So, you're pumping it all, all, the, all the times. Yep, yep. Because again, we're wanting to pull people away from that 10 of like, oh man, our overflow rooms are even maxed. So like, and we got tons of room at 1130. And again, just figuring it out, like is 1130 long term? I'm not sure Brian will decide. Um, again, just l leadership, it's a hard thing for me not to say like, can we just move it to 1115? And I would never say it outside this room. I have great respect for Brian. He's killing it. That's why we hired him. Let him do his job. Um, but we would do it after the 11, 30, and 5 to really push people that way. Yep. It's such a hard balance. Um, and we've been in every kind of setup that you can think of. So we have two buildings, uh, one that we own as much as you can own as a Methodist. And uh, the other we could own, it's fully paid for, it's that St. Croix one. Um, but the Methodist, Minnesota Conference still owns that. And technically, I think they own everything. So kind of throw that out there. But um, the other one, um, one was the one that we merged was in a, the main theater hall in Sioux Falls. The other one is currently in a school. And the T campus, our first campus, is in a strip mall that was the nastiest place I've ever seen before we took it over. It was a combination of Subway, who shares the building, and the smell of sewer. The worst smells ever. It was a liquor store, a casino, a gym. Um, so that was our first one. We got that space and flipped it. Our, our Sertoma campus, the one that needs to be out by, by August, they need a building. We either need to give it steroids uh, and give them a building or close the campus. Because they're at that 300 mark. 
and I don't think they will go north of that without something. And they've been in it for a year and a half, so it's just getting time. So you can start up, set up teardown. Set up teardown as, as a safer way. It's a more cost-effective way. Or you can decide, especially if you have a solid campus pastor and a base of people. So T, um, I'm kind of going all over the place. We didn't want to go multi-site. So the person who mentioned multi-site <coughs> to me the August before we took off, some of you might know him, Paul Nixon. I thought, I thought Paul had lost his mind. I was like, I do not trust anything you say now. But um, so we did not want to go multi-site. We were going to do a $2 million project. So our, our main campus that I preach from, it has a multi-purpose room. We were going to do a $2 million project and make that multi-purpose room a second sanctuary. And so what we were going to do is we are going to have an 8.30 service, a 9, a 9.30, 10, 11, 10.30, 11. We were just going to hit it back and forth. Um, the week before our church vote, our banker called and said, so I did the numbers wrong. You actually need twice the amount down. And we couldn't afford it. I was like, I mean, it was one of the hardest blows ever where you're just like, the week of, we've done all this legwork. I wanted to, he's a close friend of mine, I wanted to strangle him. Like, we've been doing this for months. And we'd already spent $50,000 for an architect, all this kind of stuff. Oh, it was hard. I went out to my car, I had a pity party, talked to Paul Nixon. Paul Nixon said, well, I was wondering when you, when you were going to go multi-site. And I was like, you jerk. I want you to wallow in the dirt with me. And so I came back in, uh, grabbed uh, Travis, our executive pastor, and Rob, our, my kind of right-hand guy at the time. And in 10 minutes, we decided to go multi-site. No kidding. Travis is like, I already have three small groups that I've started in T, this little community. He's like, and I kind of want to be a campus pastor. I've, I'm not really like being an executive pastor. And I was like, what? And he's like, I don't really like it. I want more hands-on ministry instead of sitting in an office being an executive. That sounds terrible. I didn't sign up for that. And so we literally decided, and that's what we did. So we, we started in a strip mall. And now it's outgrown the space. And now we have a person who's come to us and saying, hey, I have a construction company. I want to give at least $100,000. I want to do this to make it help, help it possible, get it possible. And so that's what we're kicking on now. And then our Sotoma, we have a space that we're looking at for that. So I'm hoping we can do those two buildings. Um, but it's just really figuring it out. Like, when to, there's not really a science to it. In the past, I used to look for a campus pastor, money to do it, and people. Like, did I think people would come? And if they said yes, I would, I would green light it. Now we're like, man, is, is less more. And so we're trying to figure out that balance. Even though people like a smaller sanctuary, it's trying to figure out that dance. So. For outreach into your community, I would imagine that the best tool you have is your invitational culture. Of yeah. Culture. But looking at social media and online opportunities and ways to connect, what would you say is your key tool? Is it, you mentioned Twitter, Facebook, your website? Um, it's so weird because it's kind of, social is losing a little bit of its effectiveness because everybody's shouting. I mean, if you're selling something, whether it's lotion, cream, anything, you're, you're pushing out there. We try to create tools that people want to talk about. So even for the marriage event, uh, if you're a couple at Embrace, you can get your, a Polaroid picture taken, which is kind of an 80s feel. So get a Polaroid picture, and then we have a sticker that goes on the bottom of the Polaroid that says, join us for the marriage event. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that showing up all over the place. Mm -hmm. People posting, I love my husband, I love my wife, so thankful for them. And then on the bottom of their picture, they're telling people about the marriage event. Mm -hmm. So was that an, this is what I've seen. Is that an event that you guys went to? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's, it's two weeks from now. Where, where do I find out more about that? EmbraceMarriageEvent.com. And so it just, that net, like, that's what you want to figure out. Just that thing that people want, like people want to post a picture, a cute picture of themselves, especially a cute picture on a Polaroid picture that people don't have. People want to post that. So just some of those things that people want to do. Um, or just even like encouraging people with like the, the sticky phrases on the screen. So, um, the stick, one of the sticky phrases this week is sin, sin is when we give in. 
Sin is when we give in. Sin is when we give in. So I would see people tweeting because it's just there for you. Like it's on the screen. Sin is when we give in. People screen, like taking out, as I'm preaching, they're taking pictures and they're typing. They're pushing it out for us. It's like, wow, where, where was that message at? Oh, is that this embrace? Oh, like that's the stuff. It's harnessing those sticky phrases really, really well. And making sure, this is the challenge though, making sure they don't just sound nice, make sure they're true. We're not, we're not five steps to a better life. We're five steps to following Jesus. And so make sure that it's not like cute self-help stuff. We don't need self-help. We need a Savior and a Lord. And so making sure that they're not just catchy, but they're actually truthful. Because if you get the combination of those two things, it's, again, dynamite. I'm talking too much. No, don't worry about it. I was giving a heads up. There's <laughs> too much bangle talk. Too much. I was, I was just going to mention the Steelers. Some, some bitter Steelers fans. No. Have a great day, guys. Oh, no. No worries at all. Thank you. Have a, oh, awesome. Have a lovely day. Yeah. Ready, set, go. No, no don't be sorry at all. Yeah. Uh, clearly, I mean, you don't think of, like, a Methodist word, and, and I, I know the struggles of that. You just shut down a, a campus larger than 90% of your own churches. Yeah. Um, and yet, you live in a 300-year-old institution. How do you do it? Um, so, yeah, so um, I can, I'll, I'll speak really openly and candidly. The first four years, it was brutal being a Methodist. <laughs> like of the church, because again, program for failure, and treated, um, uh, for a long time when I talked about forgiveness, <coughs> I would picture my leadership within the conference, like in having to forgive them, yeah. of just like, that was just not right what you said to me, yeah. and you know, you're on the A team, and so that's why you're getting, you're getting <coughs> treated like this. And I'm like, I don't want to be on the A team anymore. I didn't sign up for the A team. And so there's just a lot of pressure in politics. Anytime money's involved and blah, 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 blah. And they're getting all kinds. And I, on the same side, they're getting heat from pastors who have been pastors 30 years older than me that aren't in Sioux Falls, that have been begging to go to Sioux Falls, and now this, and turf and stealing people. And so the first few years was brutal. And especially knowing that my home church was footing most of the bill. I'm like, my home church is not saying a word. Roger's not saying anything, and he's not paying for it. Why are you guys complaining? Um, now, though, I'm honored to be Methodist. I love being Methodist. Uh, leadership is so important. And that's what I'm figuring out through this hard, crappy season, leadership-wise, with our staff. Man, that falls on me. And so I, I don't have it figured out either. But Bishop O um, is a game changer. And, and I loved our previous bishop as well. Um, bishop O is a, is a little bit of a bull in a china shop, but we need a bull in a china shop. The Methodist Church needs a bull in a china shop, and he is. Early on, um, one time our young clergy were together, and they said, his bedside manner isn't very good. And he's making all these changes and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, do you hear yourself? That's what you've been asking for for the, the last decade. Like you've been asking for change and for someone to make hard decisions and now a guy does and you're pissed? I'm like, you sound like you're 80. Shut up. <laughs> like, I'm like, and I, I see that in myself too of like, shut up, Adam. Like, what are you doing? And Bishop, oh, I mean, he, he just, he pushes the limits. And he pushes in a gentle way, in, a, in, a, in leadership wise. He equips people, so leadership is key. I mean, he just is so good. Um, and even early on, so Bishop O, like, we had three separate boards, and I'm like, this isn't working. Like, ah. Oh. So he said, he's like, Adam, who you need to call is Brad Kalajanian at Cornerstone in Michigan. And I was like, I've heard of Brad. And he's like, I can introduce you. And so he did. 
introduced Brad and I. Brad called and said, hey, uh, Bishop says you want to change your leadership structure. Uh, and so I said, I, yeah, I wish we could, but we can't with the Book of Discipline. And he's like, nope, uh, we can figure that out. And so I said, really? And he's like, yep, you need a trustee, you need a finance board, and you need a staff parish. Instead of them being three separate things, let's make them one. And I was like, we can do that? And he's like, we did. And I was like, you can do that? And he's like, our bishop signed off on it. So it's almost just kind of like, well, they did it, so we're doing it, so whatever. And it was one of those game-changing things. So we're still living in Methodist land and still being Methodist. Theology-wise, I cannot be more Methodist. I mean, I am, whole, I am a Wesleyan, even though I grew up Lutheran. My extended family is Catholic. Found Jesus in a Methodist church, went through Asbury, which is kind of Methodist, non-denominational Wesleyan. Um, interned at an E-free church, a Baptist church. I'm kind of all over the place. Theology-wise, I'm Wesleyan. I'm Methodist. And so I feel really at home there. So it doesn't feel like I'm, <coughs> doesn't feel like I'm fake at all. And, um, and the more I read a Wesley, the more I feel Methodist. I'm like, I almost want to say to most Methodists, have you read Wesley? Yeah. I don't know if you'd like that guy. He seems a little intense. I read through it and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know? Just I read through his sermons again. Um, for, I stole my father-in-law's, one of his seminary books. It's just this, the w- Sermons of Wesley. It's just this black book, whatever. I'm like, oh my goodness, what is this thing? And so it's just powerful that way. So um, it's been an interesting dance, and yet I feel like some of those things are Methodist. Like not having the main Method- United Methodist in our name, I kind of feel like Wesley would be all right with that. Um, doing some things, I'm like, I kind of feel like you'd be okay with that. And so, and more than that, I think Jesus would be okay with that. And so, it's kind of that dance a little bit, but I, again, I really, early on, I struggled. I mean, I had to write a monthly report on how Embrace is Methodist. I'm like, are you kidding me? And when I got a new DS, I started sending it to him, and he's like, why are you sending me a one-page report on how Embrace is Methodist? And I'm like, because I have for the last four years. He's like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, well, it's the conference doesn't think we're Methodist. (coughs) <coughs> and we are. And one of the other areas, and I might be heresy here for a second, so we do dedications at Embrace, which is an interesting dance. So even that, and I'm not a person who falls on swords for much of anything. I hate conflict. It's part of what led from to the summer. I got to enter into conflict more often. But um, I got into my, uh, just talking with my DS one time, he's like, you can't do dedications. And I'm like, we have a prayer blessing in the the Book of Discipline, you can do a prayer blessing. I'm like, I read the words, it sounds like the same thing. Yes, but you can't call it dedication. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, just one of those moments of like, ah. And then like, uh, so I called another Methodist. I was like, hey, I see you're doing dedications. And he's like, yeah, he's like, the EUB used to do dedications. Are you connected with the EUB? And I was like, our parent church was an EUB church. Talk about maybe twisting things a little bit. And he's like, well, then I would do the stick true to your roots. Do dedications. I was like, so, and now, now the person who helped me kind of dance around that is my DS. I mean, he's done dedications at his church for years. He's like, you got to be kidding me. If someone brings their kid to my church, I'm going to pray over their kid. Call it what you, <coughs> call it what you want. That, but here's the thing, though. Um, the one thing that I am, I like theology-wise, more of a stickler, just I, I'm clear with my team. I don't like the, the re-baptized language. It's like, no, it's, you're reaffirming your baptism. And well, that doesn't seem like a big deal. And I'm like, no, I, I, I don't think it is a big deal. Like, I don't think God's going to like, you said re-baptized. I don't think it's going to. But well, the thing I love about it, especially for my parents who are so faithful to their vows, is even if your parents have you baptized and they never are faithful for a day, the Lord is always faithful. Mm-hmm. He's always been pursuing us. Provenient grace. Oh, he's been pulling us the whole time. And so I love that acknowledgement of like, no, I'm reaffirming something. And what, even for parents, what's so cool, a girl my age got baptized, and she, she, she reaffirmed her baptism, and her parents came unglued. I thought it was really disrespectful and all this kind of stuff. And I said, Danae, I said, actually, this is the most respectful thing you could do to your, for your parents. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you're fulfilling what they prayed for 30 years ago. It actually happened. And I said, so you honestly, like, and I said, I'd be willing to meet with your parents 
this is the most honoring thing you could ever do because you're saying, Mom and Dad, you were faithful. What you prayed for, it happened. Like, I've made this covenant my own. And so it's really cool just to walk through some of that. But early on, it was a little bit more dicey. My very first dedication, we are a year in. This is just like supervision. I'm like, are they wiretapping something? I did a dedication at night, a Sunday night, Monday morning, I got a call from my DS. I'm like, heard they did a dedication. And I didn't even know it was not something you should do. Again, I was a brand new Methodist. I didn't know anything about Methodist. And I was like, well, I guess we can't do that anymore. <laughs> so, but, and some of that's good. Like we need, we need structure. We need some guidance. And even going through some of this stuff this summer, I'm so grateful for the lead team and some of the things in place because of the Book of Discipline. So it's, it's definitely a double-edged sword and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So I don't know if that helps or not. Maybe. Well, Say, I, ask any question. I hear as well, and it's kind of the way of the world. It all depends on leadership. It all depends on leadership. And who you have as your DS. Yep. Yep, we got flagged for that. We did, yeah, and it's a uh, no. It's and it's leadership. Like I like our bishop. Our bishop is a bishop who is not a roadblock. He is actually pushing me to think bigger, which is such a weird thing. And I almost try to avoid him sometimes because I'm like, what is he going to ask me to do next? And I love that. Instead of like, hey, can we in 10 years do something? Maybe before I retire, by the way, I'm 24. I mean, Bishop O is like, hey, have you done it yet? Have you done it yet? With Minnesota, I told him no with the St. Croix campus. The next meeting, this is totally his personality. I'm like, you jerk. <laughs> We're in this meeting, there's 50 of us, and he's like, and Adam and Embrace, they're going to Minnesota. And I was like, I told you, I was like, liar. <laughs> but, and then he like looks at me and winks at me, and I'm like, you son of a gun. But I love that environment. I, I, like, I thrive in that environment where he's like three steps ahead of me, like saying, get on with it already. And I'm saying, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And so leadership like that is awesome. Um, and willing to have hard conversations too. Like it's not just this free handout. It's man. Like, hey, what are you doing? How are you doing this? How are you doing this? And him opening doors for me that I haven't had. I mean, the connection with it, even Adam Hamilton, is because of Bishop O. Um, Adam comes and speaks at the conference, and he pulls me aside. Hey, uh, I just wanted two of you to meet. Here's exchange phone numbers, whatever. The two of you need to know each other. And that's incredible. Instead of hogging it for himself or hoarding it, Bishop O just is awesome. So. so do you worry about your St. Croix campus because Bishop O is there now? I'm trying to live in ignorance right now. So he supposedly is retiring in two years or something like that. And I keep telling him I'm planning his tenure, like in his party in 10 years is what I'm planning his retirement. So I'm, I'm trying to dish it back to him. I don't really worry about that stuff. Yeah. I don't know, like yep. even the, the, like the denomination stuff, there's a lot more other things to worry about. And I think Jesus even said, don't worry. So I'm just like, all right, I'll just take a cue from him. And so I tell him all the time, you couldn't pay me enough to do your, his job. Sounds like, especially knowing his personality is similar to mine as far as wanting to reach people for Christ. Just all the time in whatever, just in everything, just makes me want to cry. I feel like it's a lose, 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 lose. So. Early but, in your presentation, you talked about... Uh, when you started, your thought was, we don't need another church yeah. in this area. What, what's the landscape as far as other churches out there? Yeah, so everybody hear the question. At first, I didn't think we need another church, and I would have been adamant that we don't need another church. And now when I hear of a church planter starting a church, I thank God. And I was in a meeting one time, this was four or five years ago, first UMC was looking at moving to the south side of town. They were in the heart of downtown, and we're going to look at moving out. And they said, but we don't really need to go south because Embrace is already there. And I stopped the conversation. I was like, was that a joke? And he's like, no, you guys are already there. And I said, we are not reaching all of South Sioux Falls. That's like thousands of people. We do not have thousands and thousands of people at Embrace. 
I said, if you think that first UMC can reach some people in South Sioux Falls, you better go there. And he, I think he was so surprised because it's all this territorialism, all that crap. I'm like, are you kidding me? We're not fighting against other churches. So often we are, which is stupid. Yeah. And backbiting and whatever else. Man, a challenge for me even, find the person who's on the opposite side of the table theology-wise, how they do worship-wise, and become their biggest fan. Pray for them, cheer them on, point people in their direction. Um, our churches are not full. Um, we could fill them all ten times over and there'd still be more people to reach. Here's what's interesting. So Sunnycrest UMC, at that, that was my um, second DS, um, was the pastor there when we were in the place. Um, Roy, um, old military guy, is now retired. He let us come in there free of charge in his building. He knew all the crap going on in town. And he's like, they can use our building for free. I mean, like the opposite of territorialism. Here's what's so crazy. We were there for like two and a half years. When we left, not a single person from Sunnycrest came to embrace. When we left, there were three families that left embrace for Sunnycrest. And there was one family, I, I mentioned it to Kay early, that just made me want to cry. But there were simple people and they're like, we live on this side of town and we don't, we just going to stay here. And they're still there. It's, it's, uh, um, it is better to give than it is to receive, a wise fellow once said. And it's crazy. I'm the furthest thing from prosperity gospel, furthest thing. But there's something crazy that when you are just generous and just like with everything, there's just God has a way of just honoring that like crazy. And so even like financially, generosity is like a love language of Becky and I. Honestly, we feel like we can't give enough. And church-wise, I'm like, how can we give more? And so look for ways. New church comes in town. Man, we're going to clear obstacles for them. What does that mean? We're going to stand up in front of the bishop and say, we think they need to go there. We, like, we're going to give to that. We're going to do that. And um, because you're not fighting over people. And that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Um, yeah, and it's so weird how we get that. I'm the same way, though. It's our egos that get in the way. And, and also real worries of paying bills and trying to keep a church alive. So there's real worries, but we're not going to lose people. Um, so, and I, I mean, even I just met, I grabbed coffee with a guy the other day. Uh, his uh, kids, his wife died of cancer. I just found this out nine years ago. His kids are all out of college now. Um, he attends First UMC. I actually thought he was a, a, came to embrace regularly. He doesn't. He's still at Embrace. But he gives a, he's still at First UMC, but he gives a year and gift each year because his daughter goes to Embrace. Mm -hmm. And he says, it makes me proud to know that I'm a part of a conference that helped Embrace start. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for him, it's like a pride thing of like, we helped, we helped do that. And so, just cool how you see that. And it gives life. <coughs> and um, it creates a momentum swing for all the churches. When you see a church thrive, it creates a momentum swing Especially if within your own soul you can get around the edge of feeling grudge or feeling competition. If you can get around that and really be right with God in your soul, people will see that and like, don't you think they're taking people? No, I've talked with Adam and he's been praying for him. And all of a sudden that takes away the gossip mill and a whole bunch of other stuff too. Like, he's praying for him? Yeah, he met with them and we're actually going to give him $5,000. What? All of a sudden, it's like, that doesn't make sense. You start doing stuff like that. And I think those are the things that the father just looks at and he's like, man, I'm just, I'm a part of that team. And so it's kind of cool that way. Yeah, there's, unless every, every single person's going to church, you don't have a competition program. Our competition uh, in the church is, is credit cards financially. And our competition in the church is Little League baseball, soccer. Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Trying to figure out a way just to weave them in again. So, especially Ben Roethlisberger. Praying that guy retires maybe this year. Anyways. On that last point, not so much the Steelers, but the competition. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Oh, yeah. And the leaders are saying that's the only time we could find. How do you, in your context, work to counter that trend? And how, what inspiration, advice, 
wise guidance can you give to us as we seek to reach people? Yep, so I would say a couple things. Uh, first, don't beat your people up for doing something that you would do if it wasn't, your paycheck wasn't dependent on it. <laughs> you know, like, because I think there's weeks that Beck and I would skip church. Um, even though church is a huge priority for us as a family. Like, I mean, we would faithfully attend a church if I wasn't a pastor. It's just that necess necessary. So be truth-telling about that. Like, the week on um, Jesus being the cornerstone of our lives, I talked about worship. And worship anywhere. You can worship God anywhere, but there's something powerful that happens when we come together as a church body. And maybe we're coming not for ourselves, but for somebody else sitting next to us. So being a truth teller about it, but at the same time, uh, not beating people over and making them feel like they worship Satan for a little league. But I, I think when they begin to realize what's missing from their life, they'll long for it and they'll, they'll search for it and seek it out. Um, as far as what to do, I think if, if what we're doing is winsome and contagious, I think people will come and um, try in different service times. So right now, one of our campuses has a Monday night service. It's in Lake Country in Minnesota. I mean, our St. Croix campus, uh, half the congregation, no kidding, probably has a lake place. So, I mean, it's just, you go to the lake on weekends. It's, what, it's like a lifestyle. It's not for the rich. It's for, if you're a Minnesota, from Minnesota, that's what you do. And so... Um, so we have a Monday night service, and so we're trying to figure that out, and it's actually worked great over summer. Our T camps did it over summer, and he's going to do it for sure again next summer, and he thinks our broadcast camp should do the same. So kind of trying stuff out there. Also, people giving people tool, tools, so iTunes, letting them know, hey, get the message. Even though you missed it, get the message. Watch online. Check on Facebook, Facebook Live, because people are going to be hit or miss. The, the place that I'm looking, though, is we've already mentioned, we talked about it earlier, is a church like HTB. How are they doing it? Um, what are they doing? Like, how, how are they exploding in a place that makes this feel like the Bible Belt? You know, like, how, like, how are they doing that? Another buddy, I've never been to his church, uh, Josh Gagnon, is in Next Level Church. He's up in the New England states, a little bit north of here. And um, his church is thriving and exploding too. So even looking at, like, what are they doing? Are they doing different service times, LCBC? Like, what are they doing? Like, how are they doing it? Like, because I feel like we have started to feel that and embrace of that change, even in 12 years. It's crazy. And so just trying to figure out, like, what are their churches doing? What are their churches doing? Um, so I think just studying what other churches are doing, especially in settings where it's coming to us soon and kind of being ahead of that curve. So that Monday night service was great. Um, and I know it's still great, and people are, are falling in love with it. So that's what I'd probably do is kind of say study and um, don't people be, beat people over the head, but also be honest with them. The thing I always feel, again, summer is so holy in, in South Dakota because um, we know winter, it could snow tomorrow, and it wouldn't surprise me, which just makes me want to cry. But what I see every single fall is people return back to the church who are spiritually dead, and they're... Marriage is struggling, like actually struggling. They're unhappy. They have no peace and joy in their lives. It's because they have not connected with God since Easter. And so just even sharing that from stage, and I share that even kind of after Easter, I kind of mention that a couple of times. Not as like a way to beat people over the head, but like as someone who cares for them. And it's amazing just even sharing that. Like I don't want you guys to return back and fall as spiritually as skeletons because you haven't ate anything all summer. And you can just see it though. So, and feel it. Yep. Um, and maybe this is later, but um, do you mind going back to that uh, question about like your values? Like I was just yeah, really yeah. interested in that, in some of that, and like how you built the culture around that, and, what the, and how you kind of, and also sort of how you came, I mean, was, how did you have a process to do this? I mean, as a church start, maybe that just sort of came naturally and you were yeah, I'm trying to see, what are we at even time-wise? Okay, perfect. What I would say is, so we've had different things in the past. So there's our vision statement, which is based on the story of the prodigal son. Our hope is to encounter the living God, to be received with compassion, to be changed by God, the embrace of God, and then to run to the people around us, just like the father runs to the son. So encounter compassion, embrace, run. Like those, that's just who we are about. Like we're not a country club. Our hope is to encounter the living God. Uh, one of the coolest things with that is um, we, a lot of times first-time guests, they'll say 
uh, one of our camp's pastors, I was explaining this recently, he stopped me and he's like, you have no idea how often I hear that. What a, a new church person will say is there's just something different. There's something different. There's something different. And I would say that something different is God. And so that they'd encounter the living God. Any, like, man, are we encountering Jesus? Like, are we, like, even praying, like, the moment that a guy on a Friday night or a gal on a Friday night or Saturday night decides that they're going to come to church, that in their soul they'd be able to sense something's different. And that guy, like, I just picture the guy who met a girl at, at, at the bar earlier and she said go to church, and he starts, like, realizing, I'm not wanting to go to church because she's cute, I'm wanting to go to church because I want to hear about Jesus because I'm kind of miserable. Just like the moment they make that decision that God will begin to stir them with something different. The compassion part, that regardless of who it is, that they be received with compassion. Regardless of your last name, your past, your story, like your income level, your education, that you be received with compassion. I always say one of the things I love about that is that even I can come as myself as well that I got on a stage. Um, one of my sem the seminary pro professors for preaching always talked about not sharing too much personal. Don't shoot, share too much personal. I've probably broken that law about 7,000 times. <laughs> I mean, I share 100%. Like, this sucks. And this is hard. No, please don't say sucks when you talk about someone dying of cancer. Okay, should I use an F-bomb? <laughs> like, have you ever seen someone die of cancer? It doesn't just... That's a bad deal. That's not what you say, someone. This sucks. Like, you can't talk right now because you're dying. There's no words, you know? So, like, I think just being raw. Um, the word compassion, um, this again, the word my, where my passion comes from. The word com compassion, I'll never forget that Alex Hershey that I mentioned a while back, his church in Indiana, Indiana he shared one night, I, I was laying in my bed, this was probably five years ago, um, a prayer request for this kid, this like 10 year old kid. So I went to his Facebook page. I realized this 10 year old kid's dying of leukemia. And then I realized they're giving updates like every five minutes. Someone's in the waiting room giving updates on him basically p passing away. Like he's like in the process of dying. And so they're giving specific requests and he's getting like hundreds of likes on everything immediately. And out of nowhere, I don't know what it was. Uh, I just started bawling. Like, I'm just like, this kid has a little sister and a little brother who are seeing their brother die. And mom and dad are saying goodbye to their son right now. I didn't know who they were, but yeah, I ached, like hurt. And uh, the word compassion, it's actually a gross word. It means to mean, uh, it means to, uh, that in Luke there, it means to be moved in your bowels. Like, like the... Like, almost like, take your breath away pain. And when I just thought about that boy dying, and I just, my, my stomach hurt, all of a sudden it was like God was like, Adam, this is what I'm talking about with compassion. So it's not just like, ma'am, we're okay with you being here. Or like, yeah, you're kind of sort of welcome here. It's like, no, we, we've been begging God and praying that the Holy Spirit would move in your life and somehow get here because we, if it wasn't awkward, we'd throw a disco ball from the ceiling, we'd throw a party for you. Like, that's like, if it wasn't of worrying about you never coming back, we'd drop a thousand balloons from the sky, and yet it still wouldn't be enough to capture God's grace and his love for you. Like, that's how he feels about you. And so, like, that compassion, so that's the second part, compassion. And again, I, like, love that I can feel that. And then change by God. And this is, like, um, that, that like everyone's welcome and yet God please change us. This is the good news part and I think sometimes we forget about the truth side of stuff. Again, it's that person of like, no, you're great right where you are. No, I can't sleep. Tell me something different. That's why I got my ace out of bed. Like, and so it's like, it's like, uh, so it's like, God, he tells us a new path. Like, and, and so we're loved right where we are. Now go and sin no more. We're loved right where we are, and yet come follow me. We're, we're, we're loved right where we are, and yet now lose your life and you'll find it. Let's sell everything and buy this, this, this prize. Like, and so like, just trying to capture that, and that's the change part. So like, God, just change us. And that's something I pray for myself every week. I don't want to be the same person. Um, I don't want to be the same dad. I don't want to be the same husband or friend. 
Um, I don't want to think the same thoughts that I thought last week. I don't want to hold the same grudges. I don't want to get as jaded as I was before I came in this service. That's the, that's the change part. And then lastly, uh, the run part. Henry Nowlin, um, in the Prodigal Son book, you can hear the Catholicism in this, but I love this. After spending time with the Father, we become the Father to those around us. That's awesome. And so it's now like all those three things in us. When we like interact with someone, they encounter Jesus in us. They like receive God's compassion in us. They see something different inside of us. We just get to run to the world around us. And when we do those four things, um, that's a powerful thing. Why I decided I was okay being Methodist, it was actually in my UM polity class of all places. That should be the place where you never want to be Methodist ever again. But afterwards, I was really struggling because, uh, so I went to, um, I came to Christ in more of a conservative church, went to a progressive college, Lutheran college, and I always felt like I saw you do one really, really well. It's like, man, your heart needs to be changed. A relationship with Jesus, no question. But can we change the world at the same time? Could we do something about the world that needs to be changed? And my UN polity, I was like processing this audibly with my professor. He said, what's cool is Wesley was both. And more than Wesley, a guy named Jesus was both. And that's what sold me on being Wesleyan and being Methodist. I was like, you can do both. I didn't know you could do both. (laughs) And so just to have that, that's a radical thing. So, I mean, if you could do both, you might just change the world. And so, so that's kind of our overall heartbeat. So we have staff values that are everything like um, this crazy family. Like basically we assume the best, we don't gossip, we encourage. Um, one of our staff values is on our knees. Have we asked God what his plan is? That's kind of the, the, the heart of it, like just a question with it. So we have those. Another thing we, we used to have in the past, and we're kind of like trying to rediscover or change them, is kind of our church values. And right now, we really don't have them set anywhere, which is crazy, but they're really what got us where we are, is one of them is we're simple. We do worship, small group serving, and very little extra. So we ruthlessly kind of try to cut out. That kind of is where that killing stuff comes from, like, Mm -hmm. just get rid of it. Like, do those things really, really well. Worship, small group serving, very little extra. Another one, um, this is actually where the rub and our staff came from, believe it or not. Like, this... Uh, in all things, we consider the first-time guest. That's what the, we lost 10 staff over this summer. But there was this thread of, that's unbiblical. And one, one person said, I can't lead worship for non-believers. And just like this weird, like, yeah. this weird, like, letter of the law type approach. I've never in my life... Uh, been questioned for being unbiblical or conservative orthodox in my theology, mm-hmm. even from seminary professors that have attended Embrace. Mm-hmm. And so that line was a hard thing, but I, I, um, I'm so glad we, that was a hill I died on mm-hmm. and have taken a lot of heat over. Because mm-hmm. um, it's like, one, I just asked, I was like, what do you think it should be? And they said, it should be in all things we consider the church person. <laughs> and I was like, ah, uh, and it was from a young person. It wasn't from old. Yeah. Right. Right. And so, again, it's this weird, like, and yet that's part of who we are. Yeah. And I, I love, I love that embraces a church that doesn't base, um, I, I always thought I'd have money, so I've never been impressed with it, um, which is maybe a pride thing in me. Um, if you give a lot of money to embrace, I assume that you must really be a part of this church and you must be really bought in, so you're probably the last person I'm going to consider when it comes to a major decision. Mm-hmm. Like, you've given a lot of money, you're probably really bought in here. We'll, we'll ask you at the very end. And that's, instead, um, it, this is kind of a crazy story. It ties into this last Sunday. There's a guy that I used to play high school sports with and against, we'd play sports against, um, kid that struggled throughout life, uh, tattoos from here to waist up, and in the middle of his chest, he's got a giant swastika. So I mean, like, hard, not poser, legit biker. You know what I mean? I'm like, you are not a poser. Okay. You could break me in half tomorrow, and I would cry like a girl. So, 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 but, uh, so he started coming a year and a half ago, 
and his wife was a girl that my mom used to give piano lessons in. It's such a small world in South Dakota. We might just be related, okay? <laughs> Anyways, I don't know if that's here true, or it's like, yeah. did we date? <laughs> did, did, you, did you date my dad? What in the world? So, um, so it's kind of weird like that, but... Um, so, his, uh, so he started coming, and God's been changing his life. God's been changing his life. Well, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, his dad got cancer. Within 15 days, died of cancer. So um, uh, you guys can judge me. I got invited to go to an MMA fight, okay? I don't know how to feel about MMA fighting. I met one of the main fighters in the country uh, through a buddy, and he told me I should come watch him fight. So that's why I was there. Don't judge me, okay? I don't know how to feel about MMA fighting. I get there, though. This is one of the coolest honors ever. I've never been more recognized in a place than there. The amount of people who said, Pastor, Pastor, you're my pastor. Hey, Adam, fist pumps. As I'm walking through, I'm like, I love that I'm recognized at a place like this. So I see the guy with the swastika, and I tell my buddy, who's still, he's unsure if he should be there too. I'm like, is this wrong before God that they're about to destroy each other? <laughs> so, so like, and it's like televised on ESPN too. I mean, like legit thing. So uh, I tell my buddy, I'm like, hey, before the end of the night, I want to stop by and say hello to that guy because his dad just died of cancer. So I sit down. The guy that I sit next to, we're, I'm not going to say the whole thing that he said. He said, you're my effing pastor. And I was like, really? <laughs> and he's like, and he was not intoxicated. I'm like, I'm like, dude, that's awesome. And he's like, my wife, she started dragging my ace to church a month ago. I hate churches. I love coming to embrace. And I was like, dude, that's awesome. So I'm like, so I'm watching the message and all of a sudden a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, it's the guy with his tattoos. And I'm like, dude, how are you doing? And he's like, I'm doing okay. And I said, I just want you to know I've prayed for you every single day. And he just like bawled. <laughs> he started bawling and he's like, he's like, I just didn't expect my dad. It was like 15 days to the day we found out. And he's like, we're doing the auction for his, his farm and stuff like this. And, and he said, this was what came from him. He said, my dad didn't have a clue if anything was happening to him. He didn't know anything else. He told me over and over, I promise you, I did not know that this was happening. But he's like, it was like God knew this was happening. And I just feel like this last year, there's been so many things that God's been at work getting my dad ready and getting me ready for this to happen. And I was like, are you kidding? He walked away and I was like, did that just come from that guy? <laughs> And then I, the guy next to me, the effing bastard guy, <laughs> says like, he's like, you know that dude too? And I was like, yeah, he comes to embrace. He's like, man, that guy is the most intense, crazy guy I've ever met in my entire life. And I've been wondering what's different about him because he just seems like a different man. Mm. Well, this last Sunday, Baptism Sunday, I got to baptize his son and his daughter and got to ask him, do you affirm your personal relationship as Jesus is your own Lord and Savior? And I looked right at him. Throughout the message, he never skipped a beat with my eyes. I mean, he was just zoned in. I'm like, I like, and all things we consider the first time guest, you give a whole bunch of money. I might talk to you about a decision that might upset with you, but you want to know who we're making decisions about? It's the guy with a swastika on his chest. You want to know the VIP in this room? The guy that every, he's going to walk past, just so you know, Jesus is going to walk past all of us, and he's going to go see Russ Gardner and say, my son, man, I've heard about, I knew about your dad, and I just want you to know that I love you and I still care for you. I'm like, yes, you know, just seeing that, and that, like, uh, the story of, of the woman uh, cleaning Jesus' tears with his feet. If he was a prophet, he would know better about who, he, how, about who she was. And I'm like, man, he knows more about this guy than the swastika. <laughs> you know, like, he knows more. It's like, but a, a guy, he's probably never given a cent to the church. I'm judging. But I'm like, I want to be a part of a church like that. So that's one of our values is in all things. And here's the turning point. It's not in all things we bend over for the first time guest. It's not in all things we change the message for the first time guest. It's just in all things we consider the first time guest. That's where the letter of the law approach is getting hung up. 
And, I, and like, I was like, you don't understand. Most churches never consider the first-time guest. They speak in a foreign language. They try to turn, they do everything to say the first-time guest not welcome here. And I'm like, and I open up the Bible every time I see Jesus looking at that first-time guest. So that's one of our values. Another one of our values is in all things are best but not perfect. So we do everything to the best of our abilities, but are the first to admit we're far from perfect. And what I love about that is on a Sunday, if my mic does something really weird, I call it out and make fun of it. It's not like if it has everything to our best, but we didn't mention but perfect, we'd get really tense in those moments. It's like, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. But it's like, no. Uh, our, everything to the best of our ability, but we're, we're, not, we're not perfect. And so it's that lightheartedness. So it's bringing our A game, but bless you, but realizing like, man, when something screws up, I usually mention like, did I say something wrong, God? Like, if there's this weird noise, I'm like, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> I'll say, like I'll, and that's just totally me. Like, it's not me being a fake or a, like, performance. I'll say usually something, we're in Minnesota Viking country, so I'll say something about the Vikings or, like, God, I know you don't like the Vikings, too. <laughs> so just, like, lightheartedness. So that's another one of ours. Uh, another one of um, it feels like home. It's basically after your first time, you feel like staying. And so just, like, cleanliness. Like, uh... If we ran a business the same way we read a, ran a church, we'd be out of business a long time ago. Sometimes the only reason people are coming is because they feel like they have to go there and they have to go there and they have to go there. But it's like if you came up to Starbucks and the lights weren't on, and you came to Starbucks and someone didn't ask for your order, and sometimes you run into a Starbucks where their brand is just that strong where you'll drink their coffee even though you want to slap somebody. But like for most places, it's like I'm never coming back. Did you see the nastiness? This place is a disaster. And so just everything from cleanliness to speaking in a way like just excellent environments. And we're a work in progress in that. Some, some campuses are really good. Some campuses are really struggling. But just looking through all things and inviting someone who doesn't see. We get so used to our crap so quickly. It's like, does anyone else see the pile of garbage right over here? Oh, but that's for her. Like, that's their group. I don't care about that. Like, get rid of it. You know, like just cleaning it. Does anybody realize the toys in the nursery are nasty? Um, here's one of the things that I've always harped on at churches. I love the generosity inside the church. Uh, the Webbers are going to give a gift. Listen to this, guys. Be impressed really quickly, by the way. We just got a brand new TV, guys. And so we're so generous. <laughs> Our old crappy TV that we are embarrassed about, uh -huh. we're going to give that to the church. Yeah. Please make sure you put my name on it and send me a thank you. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, I, I'm so glad for your generosity. Keep your old pile of crap and the new, and the new TV, we'll take that. Yeah. And it's like, but, but as a pastor, you better be modeling it too. Yeah. You better not be doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, one thing to brag on Paul Nixon, someone mentioned Paul Nixon earlier. Uh, I randomly, this was when Paul and I were really early on. He called me one day, and usually it was like just during our one-hour slots that we talked before we became friends. He called me one day, and he's like, I got a really quick question. And I was like, okay, you don't usually call like this. And he's like, and it's kind of personal. And I was like, okay, what are you going to ask me? And he's like, do you and Becky tithe? And I was like, jeez, okay, what else do you want? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he's like, you guys tithe. And I'm like, before Embrace even had a name, we were tithing to this church. And he's like, I knew it. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, I just call all the churches that I, I coach to the T. Every church where the pastor's tithing, there's growth and there's health. And those where the pastor's not tithing, it's the opposite. He's like, without exception, that's all I needed. Talk to you later. I was like, <laughs> and so, but it, just even that, like, we better model it. We're talking about forgiveness, we better forgive. We're talking about serving, we better serve. We're talking about generosity. We might want to give and then look for other places to give in addition instead of being stingy. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of multiplies itself. And even when your people start seeing that, and not everybody's going to see that because you don't shout that from the rooftops, obviously, but all of a sudden there's a generous heart that just begins. And it's like, hey, Pastor, instead of spending, uh, giving you peanuts, we want to bless you. The first six years of the church, you, by, by denomination, I think, or a conference or something, you couldn't pay me less than I was paid. And that was four years into our season of growth. And I'm like, I'm the lowest paid Methodist in North and South Dakota. And yet, now I'm so grateful for my salary. Like, I am. I've never asked for a raise ever. And just the kindness and generosity of God is awesome. So making sure to model it, too. 
um, make sure you're, you're doing what you're selling. So, but those are just a couple of them, yeah. yeah. And again, we haven't really like lived, it, we've been trying to wrestle with them. So we're trying to yeah. figure out what that is because I don't want four different things. It's like, here's our vision, here's our staff values and then this and right, right. our values of how to use the toilet. And you know, yeah, yeah, right. so, so trying to figure that out. Yeah, and something that people actually utilize and know and live into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, but where they originally came from. Here's, here's what was cool. This is Travis, too, again. I, I love Travis. Two people to follow. Holly Brown is someone to follow. If, you follow. if you're on Twitter or Facebook, Holly Brown is where it's at. She's dynamite. Um, Travis doesn't post as much, but Travis, like, he's my go-to as well. But uh, Travis said, he's like, this is like nine years ago. He's like, I feel like we are so hands off on other, like almost everything, but then we're really rigid about a few things. And I was like, What do you mean? He's like, No. I, he's like, I mean it. He's like, I feel like you defend it, but it doesn't come from you. It's like who we are. Like they're like we are so hands off, but there's these few things that if you rub up against them, uh, I'm most likely gonna get an email almost immediately. And he's like, can you tell me what those things are? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't understand him first. And he's like, no. He's like, and then he started bringing up examples. Like, that bothers you, but that doesn't. And again, I don't think it's because it's you. I think it's like you're standing up for something of the church that's there. That we, so we just started to flesh out. We basically tried to find where those things are. Because uh, expectations that aren't communicated are just basically future grudges or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. But, but if you start to live them out and show this is who we are, then all of a sudden, right from the interview process, something because of this season, yeah. uh, I don't care if you do bookkeeping for us, you're going to know our vision and values inside and out until mm -hmm. yeah. you want to puke before you even take a job. Because mm -hmm. it's like, we just want you to know, like, this is what you're signing up for. Mm -hmm. And this, like, this isn't how every church should do. This is just what God has pointed for us. Mm -hmm. That's been the learning curve. Um, especially with, yo with younger folks, and I'm saying this, I feel like I'm 80 when I'm saying this. Uh, I think there's the, I think we didn't do a good job. I think there was the idea of like, I'm going to come here and I, that's cool, but we're going to change this. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of things that are open for change, but like the heartbeat, I'm like, no, we're actually, so they're like, are we ever going to not consider the first time guests? Mm -hmm. I was like, nope. I'm like, for the rest of time all these other things will change but these things were not yeah. and so that's what that's how we came about yeah so those came about between you and travis me and travis so, yeah. yeah and then i don't know again our our lead team is really and through this they've gotten their through this summer again i'm being really candid about this summer this is the first time they've gotten grilled from the church I mean, there was a lot of questions, and it just grieves you. It's just one of those seasons where you just want to ball, you know? And especially when it involves Christians, it just hurts even more. I'm like, man, it just didn't work. Um, like, there's no hard feelings. It just wasn't, we're two different creatures. Um, so they got a lot of heat from it. Like, were you guys involved in this? Who made this decision? What? Is this just Adam is running this church all by himself? Which is really hard. I'm like, oh my goodness, I've like sacrificed my soul, my kids, my marriage at times for this church. And it's a job I've never wanted. <laughs> Ever. I'm honored to do what I do. I'm not cheering and fighting for this job. And so, so I don't know how it is, but so my, our, our lead team's always been very hands off. Um, and, and yet, this, it'll be interesting to see how they walk through this season. Again, I just had another staff person last night resign. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm sharing that with them. And it, I, I saw it coming. So our last resignation was at the end of July. And I saw this person still kind of struggling. So it doesn't surprise me. But I'll be letting them know. And in the past, I would have let, not let them know this kind of stuff. I would have let them know about an executive level or higher. If it would have been a campus pastor, I would have let them know because that's a pretty big deal. But away from that, no other transition would I have let them know. So they're very hands off, um, but they are checks and balances for me specifically. So I report, I would see I report to them. But um, now what I'm realizing, because they didn't have the vision inside of them 
they couldn't verbalize it. Because I've always been a little bit embarrassed about talking vision because it feels like you're talking about yourself, but you're not. You're talking about your church. Mm -hmm. So when all this came up, they didn't understand what was different by, between myself and this other person. And I was like, it's two totally different things. Yeah. Well, why can't you both? Because it's two totally different things. Like, yeah. like they think it's wrong to consider the first time guest. And they think it's unbiblical that our church is based off Luke 15 when that's about the heart of God not about a blueprint for a church. And I'm like, but there's no blueprint for a church. But they say there is. And I'm like, if there was a blueprint for a church, every church would look the same. I'm like, there's not. There's a couple things up point here and there. And so just that knickknackiness. So now my lead team, we're, we're, we're still kind of recovering, I would say, from it. In the next few meetings, it's going to be 100% vision. Here's who we are. Here's what we do. Russ, the guy with the swastika, I'm going to be telling him about, about him you know, just in his story. And I love that we're a church that he can come and he's welcomed with compassion because when you see him, you don't want to welcome him with compassion. <laughs> Thankfully, he wears a shirt because if he didn't have a shirt, we'd have some issues. My wife might even strangle him, you know, like so we don't see, see the swastika. But it's like, no, I want a church that he can feel welcome. And, um, and so it's kind of interesting, but it's huge. So I don't know how it works in most churches. That's, a, that's an interesting thing. I think you can start to change a culture. Sadly, most of the visions of the churches is to stay alive. That's not, that's not okay. That's not a vision. So. Just a question, because how long has uh, the church been together now? Um, so started our first time in September 2006, and then went weekly in 2008. Because there's some natural barriers, yep. You know that you go through natural seasons. Oh. And it seems like maybe you hit one. Yeah. yeah, we we definitely hit one, especially when as a key leader, kind of, and um, yeah, I mean it was hard. Does it make you wonder when you've been traveling for someone for so long and you realize they don't have the same vision? I mean, how does that happen? That's how and it yeah. Um, and this, again, I can't say anything negative about the person at all. Um, this, I look back, uh, one guy said, in a season of success, sometimes you make bad decisions. And I was like, actually, it wasn't a season of success. For me, it was a season of being tired in the area of preaching. That's why I let my guard down. I look back and I'm like, you had so many red flags. Why, did you, why were you okay with this? And it was because I was tired in the area of preaching and our campus pastors hadn't started preaching yet. So I would have let anybody preach. And even Travis, in hindsight, Travis said, Adam, I've never seen a pastor more open and hands off their pulpit. And he's like, it finally bit you. And I'm like, man, it did. Because I've always been like very trusting, like guest speaker, never has to run their message past me. I just trust them. You're not going to go political up there or some crazy thing or whatever. You know, um, at least a level-headed guest speaker is not going to do that unless they're asked to do that specific thing. Um, so it just hasn't bit us, but it did. And so it was really, really hard. Yeah. And just I learned a lot. And um, personality-wise, the highest woo I've ever seen. And um, Holly said, whenever you let go of a homecoming king, it's going to cause a lot of damage. A, basically a well-loved person, right. and that's what it was. Right. So learn. Yeah. Just be wise. Like that's why I pray just for all of us, just wisdom. Because um, just to be very clear, I don't think anything, I don't know if they would say the same back to me, especially through the season, yeah. but I don't, I don't have any, like, I think they're wrong. I think they're horrible. I think they're whatever. It's just different. And thank God for different churches. Like That's why one of the things I'm like, I thank God for different kinds of churches where I'm like, that would connect with that person and then that would connect with them and that would connect with them. And thank God they don't all look alike. You know? And so just trying to, trying to dance around some of that has been interesting. But...